Good morning. Time for prayer and book club. I will say the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and we're so thankful for this book that we've been able to read. We're thankful that we're coming to the end of it and that we get to learn so much from it. We're thankful for John Maxwell writing it and taking that time to add value to our lives. <clears throat> we pray that we can be able to apply it and maybe go back to the application of each one and really dig in and do it. We're grateful for thy many blessings and we pray that as we start a new book on Monday that we can be able to learn and grow even more and that it can help us to get through the hard times in our business and in our lives. We are thankful for each other and for our team. We pray that thou bless all of us with our goals that we can have clarity and what to do and what not to do and that we can help each other. We're grateful for thee and we know that thou canst make miracles happen. And we see these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, we're on page 254. <clears throat> Here we go. We're in the middle of 254. So right above that gray box. <clears throat> well, right next to it anyway. <laughs> I love the way George Washington Carver expressed the idea. He said, no individual has any right to come into the world and go out of it without leaving behind him distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through it. That's something we should always keep in mind. So just to recap, we were talking about how to um, cultivate an attitude of contribution. So now we're on six. Focus on self-development, not self-fulfillment. One of the more important things my mentor, consultant Fred Smith, taught me <clears throat> was never to focus my life on self-fulfillment. He said, self-fulfillment thinks of how something serves me. Self-development thinks of how something helps me to serve others. With self-fulfillment, feeling good is the product. With self-development, feeling good is the byproduct. What's the main difference? The motive. Self-fulfillment means doing what I enjoy most and will receive the most strokes for doing, while self-development means doing what I'm talented and uniquely fit to do, and that becomes my responsibility. Chasing self-fulfillment is a bit like chasing happiness. It's an emotion that cannot be sustained. It relies too much on circumstances. It depends on a person's mood. <clears throat> In contrast, you can develop yourself regardless of how you feel, what circumstances you find yourself in, your financial situation, or the people around you. Number seven, keep growing to keep giving. Whenever people stop actively learning and growing, the clock has started ticking down to a time when they will no longer have anything left to give. If you want to keep giving, you have to keep growing. Reminds me of the teacup, right? Sometimes people stop learning because they have become complacent. They believe they have grown enough, or they want only to make the most of what they already have in terms of skill and knowledge. But when that happens, they start to plateau and then decline. They lose their innovative spirit. They begin to think about being efficient instead of breaking ground. They cut costs instead of investing in growth. Their vision becomes very, becomes very limited. And instead of playing to win, they start playing not to lose. That's like scarcity right there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Second thing that happens to people who stop trying to actively grow is they lose their passion. We all love doing what we're good at, but being good at something requires us to keep our skills sharp. Less skill leads to less enthusiasm and eventually discontent. If we reach this stage, we start looking behind us because that is where our best days are. We think about the good old days, the glory days. At that point, we're only a few short steps from obsoles obsolescence. Nobody wants to learn from a has-been. What kind of con contribution can we make if we get to this point? I want to give until I've given all I have, to do that I must keep growing until I can grow no more. <clears throat> that reminds me of like Brooke Hemingway and Emily because they are working the business and training. And I think, I know Brooke's mentioned before, like 
she's not super excited about the other like MLM trainers because they're not working in business. And so it's like, they just talk about what they used to do. Like it totally reminds me of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. A legendary contributor. In December of 2009, a legendary personal growth teacher, writer, and mentor died. <clears throat> His name was Jim Rohn. As a kid, Rohn grew up on a farm in Idaho. After graduating from high school, he went off to college but stayed for only a year. One year of college, Rohn said, and I thought I was thoroughly educated. Rohn took a job as a stock clerk in, at Sears, but he lived from paycheck to paycheck. By age 25, he became discouraged. He hoped to find a better path. A friend of Rohn's invited him to attend a seminar presented by J. Earl Schof, a motivational speaker and salesman. <clears throat> the main message, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. <clears throat> Sorry. Your income is directly related to your philosophy, not the economy. And for things to change, you must change. Schof mentored Rohn for five years, <clears throat> encouraging him to develop himself and pursue his dream of creating a better life for himself and his family. By age 31, Rohn was a millionaire. Holy cow. What, he said 25, so six years? Pretty crazy. Rohn might have been a success story few people knew about, but then his life took an ex unexpected turn. A friend invited him to speak about his accomplishments at a Rotary Club meeting. Rohn accepted and gave a message that he called, Idaho Farm Boy Makes It to Beverly Hills. It was a hit. Others began to invite him to speak. <clears throat> At first, he spoke to service organizations and to high school and college students, but he soon realized that people were hungry for what he was willing to teach. In 1963, he launched a conference business. During a career developing people that lasted more than four decades, Roan wrote more than two dozen books, spoke at more than 6,000 events, and developed around 5 million people. And during that time, he never stopped learning and growing. He observed, the greatest gift you can give to someone is your own personal development. I used to say, if you will take care of me, I will take care of you. Now I say, I will take care of me for you if you will take care of you for me. Oh, that's so good, because we chose. One of the greatest measures of Rome's impact is the number of high-profile authors and developers of people who consider him a mentor. At a tribute in his honor that was held in Anaheim, California on February 6, 2010, guest speakers who honored him included a who's who of speakers and mentors, Anthony Robbins, Les Brown, Brian Tracy, Chris Widener, Dennis Waitley, and Darren Hardy. How was Rowan able to help so many people grow and to help so many so many who became well-known teachers and mentors in their own right by continually developing himself? He understood that growing yourself enables you to grow others. He lived by the law of contribution. George Bernard Shaw, the writer who won the, um, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1925, understood that the best use of a human life is in the service of others. He said, this is the true joy of, of life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, the being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. <clears throat> I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community, and as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die, for the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle to me. It is a sort of splendid torch, which I have got hold of for the moment, and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. If you want to make your life burn brightly for others and future genera generations, keep rowing. <clears throat> Applying the law of contribution to your life. Number one, what is your underlying desire in life? Is it self-fulfillment or self-development? Are your efforts designed to make you feel good or to make you be your best? Is your goal to be successful or to achieve significance? Are you trying to achieve so you can feel happy? <clears throat> or are you trying to put yourself in the place to help others win? These distinctions may seem subtle, but they really make a difference. Trying to feel fulfilled is a never-ending restlessness because you will never be completely satisfied with your progress. Trying to develop yourself is a never-ending journey and will always inspire you because every bit of progress is a victory. 
yet there will always be new challenges to excite and inspire you. Make sure that no person owns you. Make a list of the key, of the key people in your life. Now think about each relationship and determine if you are mostly the giver, you are mostly the taker, or the relationship is even. If you are primarily the taker, then you need to make adjustments so the other person doesn't have power over you. How do you do that? By making the effort to outgive the people in your life without keeping score. You can do this not only with your family and friends, but even with your employer. Make an effort to give more work than your organization pays you for. Not only will the people you work for and with and with value you, but you will add value to them. And if you have an opportunity to move on to bigger and better things, you will be able to do so, knowing that you have always given your best. Number three, I have one final application exercise for you in this book, and that is to put people first in your life. Write down your top three to seven goals and dreams. Now write down the names of the most important people in your life. Be honest with yourself. Which comes first, the people or your goals and dreams? If you are like I was in early in my career, my agenda was first. Fortunately, I realized very early in my marriage that I needed to put Margaret first. That opened the door for me to be less selfish in other areas of my life. Then when my children came along, I had to put them ahead of many other things. The longer I live, the more important people have become to me. At this stage of life, nearly everything I do, even related to personal growth, is motivated by a desire to help others. Make the decision to put others ahead of your agenda, your own agenda. Put your family ahead of your own agenda. Excuse me. Put the development of people at the workplace ahead of your own advancement. Serve others instead of yourself. Commit to it and then invite others in your life to hold you accountable. And remember, sometimes the seeds you sow take a long time to grow, but you always see a harvest. So good. Love that. I love that last chapter. So impactful. And it made me think of my 10 goals. I'm like, oh, probably need to change those. <laughs> Might be time for a change. <laughs> Thank you so much, April, for hopping on with me and anyone who watched the recordings. I'm so excited to start our new book on Monday. <laughs>